Thank you for coming and thanks for your interest in native plants and natural landscaping, which has uh, been my calling since I retired and became a recovering English professor uh, some years back. And the, uh, the passion continues and it becomes more and more important as time goes on because of uh, what faces us and because of what we can do in order to help. So let's begin. Restoring native plants and a natural community. The illustration is the cover illustration from the book. It's by Amelia Hansen, who is now a staff member with the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy. And at the time that I engaged her, was simply a freelance scientific illustrator. And this illustration is from our front yard. She had a little difficulty understanding what I was saying, and I wasn't saying it very clearly, about layering as a key in restoring natural community. And so I said, well, come take a look at the front yard and I'll show you. So she brought her sketch pad and she sketched something in our front yard, which is still there, uh, somewhat altered now. And uh, then she drew up a, a draft and I said, looks like a cover illustration to me. Put some color in it and put some critters in it and we've got it. And so there it is. The other little illustration down in the left-hand corner is uh, from the Lakota Nation, Mitakuya Oyasin, which can be translated two ways. We are one or all our relations. And so that's kind of a key to what the program is about and what I've been about for the last 25 to 30 years. And the logo in the center <clears throat> is a kind of illustration of that we are one and all our relations. It's a modified medicine wheel with the colors, black, white, yellow, red, of the medicine wheel and four hands grasping one another, significant of all the races, all the directions, all parts of the cycle of life. We are one, and that includes all our relations, including the plants and all the creatures of the earth, and so far as we know, of the universe. So I'd like to begin by recognizing where we are, by recognizing that the building in which we are meeting today is on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe nations, the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Odawa. We acknowledge their many centuries of care and stewardship for these, their homelands. Let us pledge to honor them their ancestors, and their spirit by nurturing and restoring the land they love, the soil, the native plants, and all our relations. We are one. Let it be so. And I'd like to follow a tradition of the First Nations, the Native Americans, and honor a few of the elders, the teachers, the mentors, uh, to which I and all of us owe so much. And this is just a kind of sampling of people from my world and the world of my wife, Ruth, over here, that have meant a great deal to us over the years. Mahatma Gandhi, from which I've learned very much about Swaraj, self-rule, Swadeshi, 
self-place, being in place, knowing the place where we are, where we live, and nonviolence, ahimsa, to all things, to all creatures, to all beings. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who identifies herself as a mother, a scientist, in this case a bryologist, an expert on mosses and liverworts, and also a member of the citizen nation of the Potawatomi. And if you haven't encountered her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, you should. It's a wonderful book. Doug Ptolemy, to which all proponents of native plants owe a great deal, who brought science to bear upon what we intuited was the case, that insects and the whole of life really depend upon the natural communities, the native plants. That's what they evolved with and that's what they need if we are to sustain them in any real measure. So we owe a lot to Doug and he's been a great friend and mentor to me and to all wild ones and many others. Uh, Tanya and uh, Wendell Berry. Wendell is a novelist, an essayist, a poet, a, a proponent of uh, natural farming, natural care of the land, and uh, I owe a great deal to him also. And I try to include his, his wife because as in the case with my wife, um, I think a great deal of what Wendell stood for and stands for uh, is embodied in his wife. And if you've never encountered his wonderful novel, Hannah Coulter, I recommend it to you. Uh, it's the only novel he wrote that is from the point of view of a woman. And if his wife, Tanya, is a kind of touchstone for that intuition that he has of a woman's point of view, then she has to be included as one of the elders, one of the mentors. And the last is Jeff Grignon, the regeneration forester, now retired of the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin, from whom we've learned a great deal about the language of plants, the sentience of plants, the ability of the plants to communicate with each other and with us if we only relearn the language and how to listen. And I'll touch on that perhaps from time to time in the course of the program. I'll start with the bad news. Uh, we get to some good news later on, so don't get too nervous. Uh, and we get to some pretty pictures uh, later on uh, to brighten up this uh, day that's a little bit gloomy, but it's a good day. The nine planetary boundaries as established by the Stockholm Resilience Institute and a panoply of about 28 world-class scientists from various fields who tried to establish what are the nine essential systems that all life depends upon and how do we stand with those nine systems? Are they sustainable as presently constituted, as presently related? And uh, what are we doing to them? And they found that a number of those systems are beyond the limits. They are beyond the limit of sustainability. And therefore, they are in decline, in some cases, more or less catastrophic. Climate change, you can see that the, the limit that they've established is the blue circle at the center. And anything that is green within that limit is okay. Climate change has extended into the yellow, a dangerous area, but not as dangerous as some others, interestingly. Land system change, our land usage globally is way beyond the limit, farther even than climate change, more dangerously 
than climate change. Freshwater use, uh, it's okay. Novel entities that we are introducing, we don't know enough about what they're doing and what's happening to be able to establish limits. Atmospheric aerosols, again, we don't know enough. Functional diversity, the diversity of function of all the plants and all the creatures. What do they do and how essential is it? We don't know enough. The creatures beneath our feet, the soil creatures, are as mysterious to us as they were 500 years ago to Leonardo da Vinci, who commented, we know more about the heavens above our heads than we do about the earth beneath our feet. Only about 5% of the soil creatures in your backyard are known and classified by science. The other 95%, we know they're there. We know they're probably essential, but we don't know what they are or exactly what they're doing, what function, what essential function they may be performing. We do know that they are disappearing, that we are extinguishing them at an unsustainable rate, but we don't know enough to establish what the problem is and how great it is. Phosphorus pollution, way beyond the limits. Nitrogen pollution, way beyond the limits. Most scientists say that what we have done to the nitrogen cycle is probably more catastrophic than what we're doing to the carbon cycle, but that it's not getting very much attention. We keep thinking about carbon, and we really don't think about what we're doing with nitrogen, particularly nitrogen fertilizers. Genetic diversity, way beyond the limits. The diversity of the whole range of life. Off the chart, like nitrogen, so that's kind of the bad news as we know it and to the extent that we know it. One of the losses that we're becoming more and more aware of now is the loss of insect diversity and the loss of insect species. There are no very good measures of that. You probably have some sense of it just from the lack of insect life that hits your windshield as you drive the car. I know that when I was a boy, we used to have to get out and clean off the windshield every once in a while in order to see the road. And that just doesn't happen anymore. When we drove back and forth to Canada recently, I think we went through one area where five insects hit the windshield. That was it in the course of a 800 mile drive. According to measures in 26 different German nature reserves, this is nature preserves, insect biomass is down 76%. That's biomass, not numbers of insects, not numbers of species. That's just the sheer biomass, the weight of insects, down 76% in the last 30 years. And that's just one measure. As much as 50% of animals sharing the earth with us, according to the World Wildlife Fund, gone in the last four decades. That's 50% of the number of animals, not the species. If Earth's average temperature rises two degrees centigrade, and we're well on our way, 44% of all plants likely face extinction. Source of that is Science Journal 
the most reputable science journal around, May 2018. Insects pollinate 90% of all flowering plants, and they feed birds. 96% of birds feed nothing but insects to their fledglings, to their young. They can't eat anything else. It doesn't matter what they eat as adults, seeds, worms, other creatures. The, uh, the fledglings eat insects. And bird populations are down 30% since 1970 across the board. Bumblebee populations down 50% since 1970. 76% loss of insect biomass, 50% loss of local populations of animals since 1980. And finally, loss of soil, loss of soil life. Only about 60 good harvests left globally, according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, if soil degradation continues at its present rate. Here in the U.S., we're losing about 1.7 billion metric tons of topsoil each year, enough to fill a line of semi-trucks going around the globe seven times. 15 tons per second of topsoil going down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's the bad news. What can we do about it? We can learn from nature. Nature is the supreme farmer. Nature conserves. Nature doesn't waste anything. Everything gets reused, gets recycled. Everything has a purpose. And everything fulfills that purpose as best it can and as best we allow it to do. Sir Albert Howard was sent out by the British in the early years of the 20th century to teach the, uh, the backward Indian peasants, uh, Asian India, uh, how to farm according to good modern techniques. He hadn't been there more than a decade before he realized that the Indian peasant farmers, the indigenous farmers, knew better than he did how to farm because they used traditional methods and they used sustainable methods and they conserved their soil and they knew how to do it. They'd been doing it for centuries, for thousands of years, in fact. And as he proceeded with his research, Albert Howard realized that a soil teeming with healthy life will bear healthy plants and these will confer health on animals and man. And where do you find soil teeming? with healthy life on the floor of the forest and the prairie and on the floor of the ocean. And it works. And the traditional practices are almost as permanent as those of nature in forests and prairies. And Sir Albert wrote a book called The Soil and Health, published in 1948, the year after his death, in fact, in which he laid all this research out, and that has been a prime influence on organic farming, permaculture, and regenerative agriculture, which is something that we all need to support if we really want to conserve soil and the creatures of the soil and the life that depends on that. That's what we need to do. So part of this program is really about what you do as consumers, not just as gardeners. And I want us to keep that in mind, although I won't dwell on it very much. Nature is the supreme farmer, 
The Native Americans, the First Nations of North America, managed to live on the land for centuries, for millennia, and pretty well sustain themselves and the land. They knew how to do it. They had traditional methods. We tried to extinguish those methods, and we tried to teach them other ways and to uh, kill the Indian but save the man, as the saying went. And it didn't work very well. Well, it worked very efficiently to some extent, but they're still with us and they're trying to recover and pass on their traditional methods, their original instructions as they call them, and we can learn a lot from them. So what do we have here, right here? We have lost savanna. We have an ecosystem in this immediate area that is largely savanna, mixed oak savanna or burr oak openings. And that's pretty much gone. But fortunately, we have something that is a kind of strange facsimile of it. The tree cover and the lawns and the shrubbery of our urban, suburban landscape. And if you want to know kind of what that original landscape looked like, take a good look at Southwest Nedge Park, where there are a scattering of oak trees and then a just kind of open area beneath those oak trees. And you'll even find in one area next to the walk a uh, native planting of shrubbery and native plants, native wildflowers that attempt a kind of facsimile of what would have been there as the rest of that system. And that was uh, devised and planted by Tyler Bassett, uh, a good friend of ours who's now working for Michigan Natural Features Inventory, but who graduated from uh, Western with a degree in biology and worked for us on our yard and on our projects for a little while. And that helped to get him going into what he has turned into a, a very successful career. And so he comes back to us and we helped to fund that planting there. So take a look at it sometime. You'll get maybe a little sense of what could be the future. If we take what we've got and work with it in a traditional way or a kind of mimicry of that traditional way. Yes. I'm not, uh, I, I'm not pulling up what park you're talking about. It's, it used to be called Pioneer Park. It was the original, originally Pioneer Cemetery. It's a park uh, not too far from Vine. It's in the Vine neighborhood and it's uh, on Southwest Nage on the east side of Southwest Nage. And it's a park that takes in about uh, two city blocks oh, okay. of area. So uh, take a look at that. You get a sense of what might have been something like the past and what could be something like the future. Oak. Oak openings, oak forests, oak woodland, those were the dominant systems. Doug Tallamy's latest book is The Nature of Oaks, published just this year, which is a kind of month by month summary of the value of oak trees as a keystone species. The species that kind of organizes and holds everything together and that provides more food than any other species to insect populations. It supports, I think Doug's latest count is 556 species of Lepidoptera, of uh, moths and butterflies, and thousands, thousands of other 
species of wildlife from little tiny insects on up. It's a keystone species. If you have a place to plant an oak, plant an oak. Uh, it's absolutely essential. And Doug's book is, is a, provides you with a really good argument. And then at the end, he tells you how you should plant one. He's got the, uh, the instructions there too. So uh, take a look at that if you haven't already. It's a keystone species. It's very long lived. And it sequesters more carbon than just about any other tree species. And then you want to pay attention not just to that keystone species, but to the rest of the system to which it belongs. The natural landscaping of the system. And there's a map of tall grass, oak, savanna, and woodland. The dark is tall grass, savanna, and woodland, largely oak as keystone species, and the rest is tall grass prairie, intermixed with savanna and woodland. To complete the system, you need all the layers. The canopy, and these are pictures from our yard, virtually everything from here on is pictures from our yard. The canopy layer, oak, and hickory on the left you see up there. Underneath, red bud and dogwood. The shrub and vine layers, viburnums, elderberry, honeysuckle, native honeysuckle, not Asian, and native bittersweet, not Asian, both of which are invasive. And then the center and right, the canopy, is black cherry, and the understory is pagoda and gray dogwood, the shrub layer, maple leaf and nannyberry viburnum, Indian currant, and then down to the forges, the forbs, the sedges, and the ferns. All those layers are part of the system and part of essential landscaping for wildlife. Because each layer provides a different set of niches, and every little niche within each layer provides for a different kind of system of uh, organisms. So they're all part of the system. So many of them serve as host plants for the Lepidoptera, for the moths and butterflies, which in turn support the birds. Wild cherry, which you saw as one of the canopy trees in our yard, 456 species. Burr oak, 534, that's an old figure. I think Doug's latest figure is 556 or something like that. Hawthorn, 168 species. Hazelnut, 131. Witch hazel, 63 species. We're down into the shrub layer now with witch hazel and uh, hazelnut. Wild plum and generally prunus species. 456 species of Lepidoptera. Service berry to the left, 124 species. And there's witch hazel, which is blooming now in our yard. Uh, it's the only plant that blooms after the leaves drop and that uh, blooms on into December and uh, has wonderful kind of strange uh, yellow curly flowers on it. And uh, it's a very interesting plant to have. Michigan holly, the upper left, 104 species. High bush cranberry, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Michigan holly is the lower left and uh, uh, high bush cranberry is the upper left. Uh, nine bark in the upper right and bladder nut. It supports only two species of uh, Lepidoptera, but those uh, little pods of the bladder nut are uh, very interesting. The uh, seeds are loose in them, and the Indian children and the settler children used them as rattles, collected them and used them as, as toys and rattles. And uh, 
In one very cold January, I saw a chickadee take one of those pods and keep shaking it and keep working at it. He must have worked at it for 20 minutes before he got it open and ate the seeds. And a cardinal was watching him all the time he was doing that. And the chickadees, well, chickadees are ground feeders. They don't like to sit on a twig and eat something. Or, uh, I mean, they, they are not ground feeders. So every time he dropped it, he'd go pick it up and take it back up to the twig and keep working at it on the twig, not on the ground. And the cardinal, when the chickadee finally succeeded, evidently thought, well, if a chickadee can do it, I certainly can. And he started to work. So it's an important food at a very scarce time, a very hard time, I think. So I like to keep it in the yard. New Jersey tea, we're down to the shrub layer now, host plant to 45 species of Lepidoptera, lead plant, also very attractive to uh, pollinators. And both shrubs adapt well to savanna and woodland edge with some tree cover, but not a lot. And lead plant, when it blooms, the bees just swarm on it all kinds of species, from bumblebees on down to the tiny little uh, native bees. They're all over it. And there are about 4,000 species of native bees in the U.S., about 400 in Michigan, and we're losing large numbers of them. And the native bees are, are terribly important. Mostly we are conscious of the loss of honeybees, which are not native. Uh, but the native bees pollinate, you know, 90% of flowering plants in our area. And they pollinate actually about 30% of our crop plants are pollinated by native uh, bee species. So if we lose them, we really lose the system. And there are places in China where they have lost all the bee pollinators and farmers have to go around by hand and pollinate their crop plants. And I don't think we want to get to that point. Herbal layer. Again, there are layers within the herbal or vegetative uh, layers like the compass plant, very, very tall, Culver's root, very, very tall, on down to much shorter plants. You see there uh, bee balm and uh, some uh, coreopsis and a number of, of sedges and, and, and grasses, all important to the system. Medicinal and edible plants. We want to provide not just spatial layering, but temporal layering. Plants which flower in the very earliest spring to the very latest fall flowering, because they're all important and they're particularly important for the native bees. The native bees are out far, far earlier in the spring and far, far earlier in the day than the honeybees are, and they continue on much later in the season and much later in the day than the honeybees do. And they're actually more efficient pollinators than the honeybees. The honeybees do it by numbers, and they're very efficient at doing it because there are such great numbers of them. Any single native bee is actually a much more efficient pollinator than a single honeybee. So they're very important to us. And these plants are, are interesting to me and to us, not just because of their value to uh, wildlife, be because also of their value uh, to us as uh, human uh, beings. And I always try to touch a little bit on the uh, kind of traditional uses and the traditions underlying these native plants. 
they have a history. They have a cultural history. Uh, Jacob's Ladder, there on the left. One of its common names is abscess root. And it's an effective remedy against abscesses, open sores, also colds, coughs, bronchitis. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's also a threatened species in the state of Michigan. Virginia bluebells, the center top there, common name lungwort. So if you look at those common names, you get a sense of the tradition, the cultural value, the medicinal value of the plant. The Cherokee used it as a pulmonary aid, lung diseases. The Iroquois used it as an antidote to poisons. Blue cohosh in the uh, lower right there, disappearing in the wild because over harvested. Sore throat, inflammation of the uterus, good for them. Twin leaf, a special concern species uh, in the center uh, bottom there. Tonic, an expectorant, and another common name for it is rheumatism root. Again, a clue to some of its past uses, its history, its cultural significance. Giant Solomon seal, woodland flocks there in the upper left, golden seal uh, in the lower right along with trillium. Golden seal together probably with echinacea you will find in your health store, uh, very common booster of the immune system and cold remedy still. Very uh, popular with herbalists. Bloodroot. All of them important culturally, important ecologically. Wild columbine. And here you see some layering within our backyard uh, of early spring wildflowers. Wild columbine and then the layer just behind that uh, appendage water leaf just behind that ferns and underneath those would be woodland flocks, uh, the lower layer. And then that tall stem to the right there is a, a kind of a strange, interesting plant called American Columbo, which finally bloomed 15 years after I planted it. <laughs> and that's, that's about its common lifespan. It will bloom within eight to 15 years, and then it will set seed and die. That's it. Uh, I've got another one that I've been waiting to have bloom for 17 years, and it still sends up the basil leaves every year, and it's still gathering its energy, and it will send up eventually a six to eight foot stalk and bloom, and then it's going to be gone. So if you're prepared to wait a while, it's a very interesting plant. Joe Pye weed, again, a, a kind of cultural history, named after uh, an Algonquin Indian named Jopai. And uh, we Western Europeans don't like to pronounce funny names, so we change them into something that's familiar to us, Joe Pye. Uh, but Jopai was a healer. He was a a shaman, and he knew his herbs, and he knew how to use them, and he was a very good friend to the settlers who were subject to all kinds of problems and diseases. And when his tribe was forced to leave and migrate west, he decided he would stay on. He had good friends, but he said, eventually I will want to follow you. So here, you take these seeds and you drop them from time to time so that I can follow your trail. And they were the seeds of Joe Pye weed. So we've got them now. And that's the story. And I believe it. Uh, and it's one of the wonderful tales of uh, 
the uh, First Nations of our area and tells us something about their history and their sense of themselves, I think, as well as a sense of, of ourselves. For shade, for moist soil and lower layers, tall bellflower, uh, which is a biennial, it will bloom in the second year and set seed and, and die and just kind of move around. A uh, closed gentian in the upper left, shooting star, great blue lobelia, red baneberry. One of the values of, of these particular plants, at least in our yard, is that the deer don't touch them. Uh, I can give you a list of, of what, at least in our yard, the deer avoid, but I can't guarantee that they won't touch them in your yard. But, uh, I've, I've uh, tried to adapt to uh, what we have with us, and the deer are certainly with us. Host plants for monarch butterflies. There's one for just about every situation. Poke milkweed for shade, swamp milkweed for wetland, common for sun, or butterfly weed for really dry, bad soil. Uh, It'll uh, come up almost through the asphalt, but maybe not quite. Uh, very, very wonderful plants and important, not just for the monarch butterflies, but for lots of other creatures as well. Autumn woodland and edge plants. These are plants that you want to have as keystone species for the late bees and butterflies. Um, they're, they're, they're keystone species, for instance, uh, goldenrod species support about 180 species of Lepidoptera, of moths and butterflies. Same with asters, somewhere around 180 species. And not only that, but they send down good roots, they hold soil, they hold moisture, uh, they support other plants and prepare the soil for those other plants to come back in the spring. They're very important species to the whole cycle of life, not just to that bloom time in September and uh, October. And they're still uh, blooming uh, quite profusely uh, in our yard, many of the, uh, of the species. On down to the ground, ground covers. These are ground covers that we've found especially uh, interesting. Uh, Brown-eyed Susans spread and seed themselves. Uh, Rudbeckia triloba fall blooming, as opposed to the Rudbeckia herta or black-eyed Susans, which bloom quite early on and are an early succession species. Uh, Canada anemone forms a, a nice kind of shade ground cover. Pussy toes, if you have the right situation for it. Wild ginger grows in all kinds of difficult shade situations. And uh, you won't get any spectacular bloom from it. The bloom is under all of those canopy of, of, of leaves. And uh, it's not even accessible to the bees. Wild ginger is pollinated pretty much by ants and uh, beetles. But it will spread rhizomatously and uh, form a good ground cover for you, even without the, uh, the pollinators. Down to the soil itself, roots. Most of you are probably already familiar with this diagram. One of the wonderful things about native plants is that the savanna and prairie plants at least send down deep, deep roots. Uh, lead plant down 12, 14 feet same with compass plant, uh, the grasses anywhere from five to 10 feet down. And you take a, a clump of uh, say big blue stem grass, just one clump has uh, roots and rootlets, which if stretched out would probably be a thousand to 2000 miles of roots, just one clump. And a third of those roots die every year 
and leave channels that channel water down into the soil and retain it and then release it slowly to the other plants. So they're part of a circulatory cyclical system. And that's true in one way or another of virtually all of the native plants. That's why they're so important uh, to us and to the whole system that everything depends upon and that we also uh, depend upon. Depth, surface, soil making channels, they build soil. The tall grass prairie built that wonderful, uh, rich breadbasket soil of the Midwest on which our corn and soybeans are grown and which we are depleting at a just unsustainable rate uh, because it's being washed away down the Mississippi and other uh, systems. Soil, the web of life in your hands, a good handful of prairie or forest soil contains more living creatures than human beings who have ever lived upon earth. That is in the billions, just one handful of soil. They may sometimes be dormant, but they are there and they're alive and most of them we don't know much about, if anything at all. And that includes the, the, the fungi, the hyphae threads of the mycelium, the vegetative part of the fungus. The fruiting part of it, the mushroom, is what we're familiar with. But underneath, there are just miles and miles of that wonderful network that extends through the soil structure. And good soil is about 50% air and water. And the water films are also extremely important to that web of life. If you took the microscopically thin water films that are around the edges of those airy openings in good soil structure and stretch them out for just that one handful of soil, that water film would cover about the area of a city block. And it's the crucially important part of the soil structure that enables other soil creatures to move, to kind of swim and surf on those films and to take in water and preserve their own being. So good soil structure is important. And that network of mycelium or hyphae, absolutely crucially important. And it's through that network that plants communicate with each other underground. They also communicate above ground through volatile organic compounds in the air, but they communicate largely underground through that web that connects virtually everything to everything else under our feet. And when we turn over the soil, when we till it, we destroy that structure and we break up those networks of fungi. 300 miles of those hyphae under every footstep that you take in a good forest or prairie. The web, says Gary Snyder, that holds it all together and that communicates. So what do we want to do? We want to try to observe Albert Howard's law of return and use what is given, return to the soil organisms at least as much as you have been given. Use your leaf litter, use whatever else your garden, your yard, your territory provides and reuse it, put it back into the soil and leave it for the soil organisms and the life that depends upon them. And you can see that uh, we've used in the past our own leaves to establish new beds uh, downed branches of evergreen or whatever to hold the leaves down to preserve them from being blown away. Cut down stems in the spring, not in the fall, 
and uh, chop them up and use them for mulch and for borders. Uh, however, you can uh, devise to use them. Uh, when the uh, uh, arborists come around and, and trim your trees, use the trimmings. Don't have them chip them and take them away. Uh, sections of tree trunk and logs and branches provide borders, resting places, seats. Serve as nurse logs. They hold moisture like a sponge and then gradually release it to the soil so that it doesn't just wash away. And they foster the fungi, the mosses, the seedlings, the insects and the microbes. And they hold carbon rather than just returning it to the, the air. Uh, as you, you would be if you got rid of them. So reminder, nature is the supreme farmer. Follow the methods of nature as seen in the primal forest, the prairie, and the ocean. Learn from traditional practices from the Native Americans. What we need is here. If we can learn to hear it, to listen to it, to relearn its language, to rediscover its methods. Nothing gets lost, said Antoine Lavoisier at the conclusion of the 18th century. Nothing gets lost, nothing is created, everything transforms. We are in a world in which everything is changing, everything goes in cycles, in circles, continually transforming, continually recreating, reusing, recycling. Everything is circular. Largely our culture wants it to be linear, to be progressing all the time instead of returning upon itself. So we have to relearn traditional accommodation of the cyclic methodology of nature. And I love this poem by Wendell Berry. Horseback on Sunday morning, harvest over, we taste persimmon and wild grape, sharp sweet of summer's end. In time's maze over fall fields, we name names that went west from here, names that rest on graves. We open a persimmon seed to find the tree that stands in promise, pale in the seed's marrow. Geese appear high over us, pass and the sky closes. Abandon, as in love or sleep, holds them to their way. Clear in the ancient faith, what we need is here. And we pray not for new earth or heaven, but to be quiet in heart and in eye clear. What we need is here. Lavoisier Lavoisier, sorry about that. Lavoisier was beheaded in the French Revolution in 1793. And uh, another person who was beheaded during the French Revolution also said something that I, that I value. Uh, Marie Antoinette, Queen of France and Navarre, beheaded the year following in 1794, says, there is nothing new except what has been forgotten. So remembering is very important. Back to the Native Americans to conclude. I'm not going to try to pronounce those Mohawk words at the top, but the translation is the words that come before all else. And that's what the, the Mohawk, the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, 
that we know of as the Iroquois. Um, that's what they call what is generally translated as the Thanksgiving Address. And if you've read uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, you know her chapter about the Thanksgiving Address and the importance of giving thanks and of recognizing what is given to us and what we need to preserve and return as gift. And the words that come before all else at the Thanksgiving address are a series of addresses to the elements and the creatures and the plants and end always with the refrain, now our minds are one. And this is the ending of the Mohawk translation of the Thanksgiving address. And this is an illustration from a, uh, a graphic version of the Thanksgiving address uh, for children and for adults. And it's the greeting to the sunset at the end of the Thanksgiving address and celebrating that part of the cycle of life, the setting of the sun and the coming of the darkness, but also the mother and the child and the future and the return of life in the continuing cycle. And the words that come before all else and the Mohawk repeat them whenever any important event comes or any important project is to be undertaken. These are the words that begin always everything that is important to them. The ending, today we have gathered and see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one, as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. And now our minds are one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Small, for your presentation today. Um, you may have noticed uh, some of the equipment in the back of the room here. This presentation has been recorded today and will be available on the library's YouTube channel. So if there is some information that you want to revisit, or that you would like to share with others, you also need to share them. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, all of the beautiful native plants um, that Tom Small shared, the library now has a seed library. That is something that is available to the community. You do not need to live in the library's um, service area to participate in the seed library. It's downstairs on the lower level, and it has seeds from quite a few of those plants um, that were mentioned today. Um, if you are interested in taking some of the, those seeds and growing them uh, on your own or sharing them with others. Were you going to take questions? Sure, if you have questions. If has questions. Thank you so much for joining us today. Any questions, curiosities, comments? There are uh, handouts here. If you didn't get all of them as you came in, there are some books for you to look at, uh, a kind of selection of, of uh, things. And at the end of the slide list, there is a list of resources, of uh, books, and uh, I think some websites that you can uh, consult. And if you like, to uh, get more information, I recommend the uh, website of the Kalamazoo area Wild Ones and also National Wild Ones, wildones.org or kalamazoowildones.org. Uh, both of those have a lot of information. And then there's our, uh, our book, which is now in its fifth printing. Uh, it's gone very well. so. Uh, my wife persuaded me that we needed 
to continue it and uh, go into the fifth printing, which we have done. And it's available in some of the local uh, bookstores. And uh, then there are a few uh, pamphlets here. And if you don't have a book, they are available for uh, $25. Any, any questions, concerns? I yes. would like to just add one thing about the book, and that is that for people who are just starting out and wanting to plant a native garden and they haven't done it before, there are lists of all kinds of plants for different types of locations. And so that is, a, it, it's, it's wonderful in that sense because it's very usable. You really do have a good beginning to put your yard together. Yeah. And there's some good artwork uh, in it, no photographs, uh, but some good artwork from local artists. And uh, I, I promised my late uh, wife, who uh, uh, died of cancer, that uh, I would finish the book. We had worked on it together for some time. I promised her that I would finish the book, and I did. And then um, I got local uh, artists and scientific illustrators to uh, illustrate it. And a local designer who at that time was just retiring as the designer for uh, uh, the Medieval Institute at Western Michigan University, which publishes a lot of books. And she undertook the design. So I think we have a very handsome and a very useful practical book. And. Uh, uh, I hope you were all familiar with it already. <laughs> so, yes. Um, I'm curious about your yard that you <laughs> referred to. What, I mean, how much area do you have? How long is, and I may have missed this because I was about two months away. But. Uh, well, we are in the Winchell neighborhood at 2502 Waite Avenue. And we have just barely under half an acre. Oh, okay. From the size of it, I thought you might say. Mm -hmm. No. Acres. We are pushing the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we probably have altogether somewhere between 200 and 250 species of native plants from the tree species right on down to. Uh, ground covers, and uh, we have six oak trees uh, in the yard, three red oak and three burr oak, and also a, uh, a dwarf chinkapin, which is very dwarf because the, the deer have eaten it down to a butt, <laughs> or, you know, uh, not, even, not even a dwarf. Uh, so we, I guess we have seven oaks. And you're welcome at any time to come by. There's a welcome sign out on the street and uh, places to sit, uh, old tree stumps and uh, a swing and a little free library to take a book and sit and swing if you like, uh, or just walk the, the paths uh, of the yard. And if you have questions, knock on the door. We like to talk to. Do you have any suggestions for starting to replace just grass? I mean, not everybody can do on the scale it seems like you're talking. And, and certainly I have tried to naturalize areas and all but there's still a significant amount of grass yeah. that, you know. Well, we didn't do it all at once, and I don't recommend trying to do it all <laughs> at once. Uh, yeah, th there's some urgency. Doug Tallamy enjoins us to transform half of the turf grass of our nation to native plants. And he says, that'll 
be a pretty good beginning to solve our problems. So if you can keep in mind transforming at least half of your yard to native plants, then you're part of what uh, Doug calls urban national park. <laughs> and I think you start, well, I would recommend starting by taking, using leaves to suppress grass. Yep. Don't try to take it up. Right. You disturb whatever soil structure is there and you stir up all the weed, the dormant weed seeds that are there. We started on our corner with about 400 square feet. And we had problems for five years with weeds and uh, soil compaction. So I don't recommend it. If you can take a year to allow leaf litter to just suppress the grass and blend in with the soil. Uh, if you started this fall, you would be ready to plant next year sometime with just uh, a bed of leaves. And we, we've sometimes built those leaves up, you know, maybe three feet deep and then weighed them down the branches or a little bit of soil. And uh, then you're ready to plant. Uh, oak leaves take a little longer to uh, decay than, say, maple uh, leaves or sycamore. We've got a giant sycamore in our yard that provides us with wonderful leaves. Um, but oak leaves are, 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 are very good. And maybe if you uh, run them through a mower or a, a mulcher, break them up a little bit. They, they're, they're wonderful uh, for the soil. And they're also good for the soil critters. So the other thing I would recommend is leaving as much of your leaf litter as you can. If you need open spaces in your yard, yeah, rake the leaves, but uh, try to use the leaves elsewhere. In the, in the yard rather than simply send them off to the landfill where they will probably generate methane. Um, th those would be my two, I guess, main pieces of advice about getting started. And then you can either seed into that and you would have to at least do a little bit of soil disturbance at the surface if you're going to seed uh, or plug into it with, with seed plugs from a local nursery. And I do emphasize that it ought to be a native plant nursery. That if you go to a standard nursery and ask for native plants, you may get a species that is technically native to this area, but you're not likely to get uh, an ecotype of this area. It might come from South Carolina or Arkansas or Nebraska. And it also might be a, a cultivar or a hybrid, which ordinarily is not as useful to bees and other critters because they don't recognize its chemistry. Instead of always feeding them seed, they would have natural seed to come. And it's very hard to find native plants, as I've been trying to find more and more the return. So they do better when you buy native plants than the hybrids or whatever you buy at Nobel's or Roman's or um, it, it's just, so I guess my question is, when you landscape for the birds, 
cranberry juices, um, what else do I drop off along, that type of stuff. Yeah, good. Does that also help the native plants or the, you know, the ground and stuff like that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I think the one thing to avoid is the standard kind of butterfly garden, which is ordinarily just one layer. It's, it's the flowering herbal yeah. layer. Uh, and, and that's important, but it does not support the whole cycle of the butterfly or the moth, or in many cases, the bee. Uh, bumblebees, the males all die, the female makes a nest, often in the ground and often underneath a clump of, say, big blue stem native grass. And that's what they evolved to do. So you're helping the life cycle of the bumblebee, which is in deep trouble in this area. Globally it is also. Um, and you're helping the soil creatures with the hawthorn or the uh, uh, high bush cranberry because that's part of the system. And you're providing a niche for other creatures as well. So you may be planting for the birds, but <laughs> if you're doing it right, you're planning for the whole system. And, and, and that's true, you know, you, you can start with a, oh, we're losing the monarch butterflies, so plant milkweed. Well, good. Um, that's a very good beginning. And consider that uh, depending on the count, there are 76 other insect species that depend upon milkweeds, not just monarch butterflies. So if you choose some kind of charismatic species to focus on, that's not all bad <laughs> because you're, you're, you're doing it for at least part of the rest of the system. And it's also a good, it's a good beginning. It's a, it's a way of getting started. It's a way that people around you are going to recognize and say, oh, monarch butterflies. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Um, and then when you introduce all those other things, they may be saying, what's this person up to, really? <laughs> because native landscaping is a subversive activity, if you look at it. It's a countercultural activity. That's not the culture that we live in. And We have to be uh, diplomatic about it, but we have to be also firm of principle that this is important, that this is crucial. So thanks for those questions. Yes. Um, on that, is, have you encountered any resistance or any like negative pushback on having a more native drive? And how would you go about um, where do you live? I live in Portage right now. Portage has a, uh, a, uh, a landscaping ordinance that allows for native landscaping. They have a process that you follow um, and that a number of people have followed successfully. So uh, get in touch with your city administration and, and find out what they uh, allow and what kind of process they, uh, they want you to follow in getting official approval. And you can get that. It takes a little kind of bureaucratic process to get it. It's more complicated than it is if you live in Kalamazoo. In Kalamazoo, the ordinance just says that the planting must be maintained. You can't just let your lawn grow or, or uh, throw some seed out there and, and let whatever happen, 
happens. You have to demonstrate that you do maintain it in some sense. That's the key word in the Kalamazoo Ordinance. And we've never really had trouble with that. Uh, there is an appeal process if the city actually got after you. And um, <laughs> the appeal process is the only really complicated part of the whole thing. The city would have to appoint a board of five, an appeal board of five persons representing various interests. And the last time we went round with the city about that part of the ordinance, they wanted to cut it out. That would be too complicated. Oh, that, that would be, yeah, we can't do that. And we fought them to keep it. And we won. Uh, and it's important because they really don't want to do that. So they're going to accommodate you if they possibly can. If you threaten to appeal. <laughs> their ruling. Uh, and I've only encountered one time when an inspector came and said, you've got to cut this down. Somebody had complained from a couple of houses down. I think that was the person who complained. And he says, you've got to cut this down to 18 inches. That's what the ordinance says. And I said, oh, gee, um, we provide seed to uh, city projects. And, um, oh, let, let's see, the city forester, and I started name dropping. <laughs> and finally he just said, do what you can. And he turned around <laughs> and walked away. Uh, we fought the battle originally back in um, 1999, I think. 1997, we started the battle with the city. Before we even started planting, we were fighting it on behalf of somebody else's planting. And uh, eventually, the city kind of came around to our point of view. And they said, OK, but we, we've got to put out a handbook so that people know what to do. And they put out this terrible, terrible handbook, which is god awful. Uh, and we said, that won't do. So we kind of loaded the city's Environmental Concerns Committee with natural landscapers, and we started writing some material, and it got into a, the, somebody's file. And then somebody came along and took it out and said, oh, well, why don't we just publish this? So there is a guide to natural landscaping on Kalamazoo City website. It's sadly outdated. I keep meaning to update it, and I haven't gotten around to it. But we are legal, uh, and we fought it through the city planning commission and the city commission, and it's all uh, very, very official. And it's not subject to all kinds of bureaucratic process. So if you get complaints, I think you talk to people and you just try to say, you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And uh, most people either like what you're doing or they kind of give up and say, well, we just, it's okay. It's not for us, but it's okay. So we have had very little, very little trouble. And we have a pretty wild looking yard. <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's not, not really tidy. Although we have nice uh, mulched paths, you know, it, it, it's obviously maintained. We do take care with that. I don't know, that, that, that does kind of answer your question? Yeah. You're welcome at any time to come. I see we're kind of running out of time, and, but uh, go ahead. Um, I, was, I was trying to remember the name of this, so I did look it up, but there is a, a, a nursery here in Kalamazoo called Hidden Savannah Nursery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it does have a lot of uh, good plants for that. Having taken a rain garden class, yeah. they were one of the... One yeah, Chad, Chad Hewson 
is the local expert and his nursery out on Van Cal Avenue is the place to go for plants and go to his website hiddensavannah.com uh, which has a lot of good information on it about what you need and the other one in the area and it's an interesting trip not too far take a little over an hour would be wild type with Bill Schneider and Bill Schneider will be the speaker at this month's um, Wild Ones meeting coming up October 27th. Bill Schneider, the proprietor, the owner, uh, and uh, a grower at Wild Type Nursery, which is the largest native plant nursery in the state. And where is it? It's in Mason, Michigan, just south of Lansing. And he's got a fantastic operation going there. And he's a wonderful person. And come to Wild Ones, uh, October 27th, 7 p.m. It's on Zoom. It's, uh, it's a virtual uh, program. So how do you and you have, to, you have to register for it uh, through uh, Kalamazoo Area Wild Ones. Just go to kalamazoowildones.org and you'll get a, a registration button to, to click. Uh, and then they will send you at the appropriate time the uh, information, the invitation with the uh, code for, uh, for accessing the program. Bill's an old friend, uh, and he's, he's really talking about the future of native plants in Michigan and the growing of native plants in Michigan and the nurseries for, for native plants in Michigan. He's, he's probably the most knowledgeable person I, I can think of in the state about native plants. He really knows the business and he grows plants for all situations, wetland, savanna, woodland, prairie. He's, he's got it all. And he, he grows beautiful specimens. He's open to the public only very unusually these days. Just a few days at the beginning of the season is he open to the public. But if you order online and arrange for pickup, you can do it just about any time. Uh, and he's, he's just a, a, a wonderful, wonderful resource. But Chad Hewson, more locally on Van Cal, 18 North Van Cal Avenue, is... is uh, also a wonderful source. And the best thing about it is that he'll, you go out there and he'll give you advice. He might even come to your place and, and, and look, but if you take some photographs and go out there, he'll, he'll tell you what will work. Thank you so much. Thank you.